Good morning and welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. This morning, we're going to continue taking testimony on S5. And we have with us the Attorney General, Charity Clark. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I um, am here to uh, answer questions about the role of the Attorney General, I think generally, but specifically vis-a-vis -vis this body, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and provide that information. So um, just a little bit about the Attorney General's office. We basically are the lawyer to the state, and we have about 150 people working in the office. I think we're twice as large as the second largest office by a statewide elected official. Um, we are the largest. We have uh, 96 lawyers. They do all kinds of things. You can imagine whatever the state needs, um, we kind of do it. So um, a, a interesting fun fact about the attorney general in Vermont is that it's created by statute, not in the constitution. In most states, it's created in the constitution. Here it's created by statute, very helpful because you can look to the statute to see what the AG is supposed to be doing. Helpful, especially if you are a new attorney general looking for what you're supposed <laughs> to be doing. So in title three, section 158, specifically the attorney general is obligated to come and appear before the legislature when they ask the attorney general to do so. So to answer the question of, should the attorney general be appearing in front of this committee, weighing in on a policy, quote, policy bill, um, the answer is yes, they're obligated to do so by statute. Um, also, one of the divisions of the attorney general's office is the civil division, which represents the state when the state is sued. So if someone has a contract dispute with the state, we will represent the state. If someone has an employment dispute with the state, we represent the state. I think you know where I'm going. If someone sues the state saying that a law you all pass is unconstitutional, we, re we represent the state. So what kind of lawyer would I be if I waited until uh, I appeared in court representing the state to say, surprise, I thought this was unconstitutional the whole time, but I didn't tell you till now. So of course we're gonna come in and we're gonna tell you our feedback and opinions about whether or not a bill would be constitutional or not constitutional, or ways to make sure a bill is the most constitutional bill we can think of, et cetera, et cetera. So we always try to make ourselves available and you will see me and assistant attorneys general um, in the building provided the feedback that you all need. Um, I should clarify that of course you have your own lawyers and that is legislative counsel. You have an attorney client relationship with those lawyers, not with us unless you know, you are individually or student or something like that, and then that develops. But just to clarify, you definitely do have your own lawyers um, with that relationship. Um, that's really all I wanted to say um, on the matter of the role of the Attorney General. I, I'll just close by reiterating what um, uh, Laura Murphy, who is here, Assistant Attorney General and, and Director of our Environmental Unit said, which is that we do support the Clean Heat Standard um, and uh, urge you to pass it. Thank you for coming in. And um, as a committee that doesn't often, you know, invite or hear from the attorney general's office, that's why we wanted to hear back from you to understand that. So the legal context was very helpful. Yeah, I'm happy. I could go on and on. And I know you have a lot to do um, today and especially S5, which goes on and on. Um, so I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm also more than happy to talk anytime about the attorney general's office and our role and what we do and all the divisions, because I kind of love it. So I love to talk about it. So you just let me know if you ever want me to come back and say more. Well, yeah. And I guess I'd be curious how you, um, with other committees who may hear from you more often, I mean, how, oops, um, how do you interact with them? Like, yeah. Well, I would say there, there are certain committees in this building, I'm going to say commerce, um, especially where there's, if you're looking for a consumer lawyer or an expert in consumer law in the state of Vermont, like almost every single one of them is next door in my, my office or has been at some point in their career. So you see us a lot on those issues because we, we truly are the subject matter experts. For this committee, you have a lot of subject matter experts at a &R, um, in addition to our office. So you might not see us as much, but in commerce, we, we always show up because we know that there's only a handful of, um, of places besides the attorney general's office where that expertise can be found. Uh, Representative Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General, for being here today. I have a long question, and hopefully it will require a short answer for it. <laughs> okay, I'll brace myself. <laughs> uh, we have heard testimony that the lack of labor force means meeting the, well, that the lack of the labor force means meeting the goals of the Global Warming Solutions Act is going to be impossible. 
the word impossible was used. Uh, where does that leave us in regards to the lawsuit provision of the GWSA that says anybody can sue the state of Vermont if we don't meet these goals? The Senate heard testimony from the Conservation Law Foundation that they are prepared to bring suit. Can we win that suit? One thing I will say is the Global Warming Solutions Act is, is law, right? And it has instructed all of us to uh, work together. And the Climate um, Council did a phenomenal job in a short amount of time to provide a climate action plan. Clean heat standard was obviously in the forefront of that plan. And um, that I was privileged to present once to, and I think that was their first meeting. And I was so impressed with the thoughtfulness that um, with the questions that I got after my presentation and also just uh, having read the plan, I was so impressed with all of the work that went into it. So I would say your question skips a few important okay. steps, which is this is the law. Um, we have a plan on how to move forward to meet the mandates of the law. And what we should be doing now is doing the best that we can to put, I mean, I'm kind of telling you what to do, but this is my take, putting in place the best um, policies and laws that we can so that we can meet the obligations of the Clean Heat, of, of the um, Global Warming Solutions Act. And I know that Laura, who was here, testified more in depth. That's not really why I'm here today. Um, but that would be my take and answer to your question. If we don't, do you feel we, you will win the lawsuit? Well, it depends on what you do. I mean, if you don't know anything on this bill, I think it's going to be a little harder. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope you pass this bill because I think it's going to make it easier. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. A <clears throat> few others have questions for the Attorney General, Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Attorney General, for coming in. My pleasure. Uh, you say you're supporting S5. Uh, from your office, uh, can you explain a little in depth of uh, what part of that you're explaining? Is it related to the statute and uh, constitutionality uh, equation that you just brought up? Are you supporting the 70 cents a gallon administrative? There's certain components of that, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Can you define or break down a little bit of what you are supporting with SY? You know, I don't want to really get into a lot of the details. Um, I know that we have tried to be helpful um, with regards to the constitutionality and those kinds of things. Um, today, I was asked to come in to, per to answer the question that was asked that Laura was not able to answer when she was here. I don't want to get into the details um, today on that. I'm not prepared to get into details on that. If you have a specific question, I can... Um, speak with Laura and then circle back with you like in the hallway. How's that sound? Sounds like a good answer than all I'm going to get this morning. So I okay. welcome. Representative Smith. Thank you. On that note, uh, you've indicated that the Attorney General's office supports S5. Uh, it's going to hurt a lot of people that cannot afford to pay more money for heating fuel for gasoline, how can you support something like that? The attorney general has to defend lawsuits brought by the state, as I just described. Sure. And um, as you mentioned, there are entities who are who have threatened to sue over the Global Warming Solutions Act and over specifically, um, or I should say in addition, um, this bill if passed. So, um, you know, I'm really focused on the job that Vermonters hired me to do, which was to be their lawyer. And I am always mindful of the impacts that our decisions and our office and this building have on all Vermonters, including Vermonters who you know struggle to make ends meet. We, um, you, you might not be aware that our office also plays an important role with assisting folks who are in that position. We have uh, rules and laws on the books related to, for example, propane. We provide um, services to 15,000 Vermonters every year at our consumer assistance program, many of whom are marginalized um, in some fashion, whether it be low income or what have you. Um, it's something that I always think about when we um, make policy. They're always on my mind. I grew up in a rural place. I, of course, 
um, am familiar with um, and am friends with the people you're describing. So it's not something that I don't consider when I take a stand on a policy and um, certainly have them in mind. And I know that the climate action plan, I think there was a whole subcommittee to um, address some of the issues that you've described. So I, I have put my faith and my trust in all of the people who worked so hard on creating that plan. And I think um, the work that this body did last session is a testament to the work of that of that uh, of the um, climate action um, council of uh, the, Cl the climate council. And I think that you know you're seeing it once again here, where there's so many people who have so much knowledge and including on the topic that you raise, which I think is very, very important, but shouldn't preclude this committee and this body from passing a bill that's going to meet the mandate or attempt to um, be a part of the solution to meeting the mandate of the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act. Representative Sibelia. Yes, thank you for coming and joining us here today. And you wouldn't be here if there wasn't some conflict over the policy. Some of us actually think we have to pass this because of the doubling of fossil fuel prices that we're seeing and the volatility in the market that is hurting rural and poor Vermonters. However, that is not my question for you. Uh, when you uh, talk about supporting uh, or not supporting, what is the basis of your support? It, it's my understanding that it's been the constitutionality, whether or not you feel it's a law that can be defended. Not the case, or is that? Well, of course, that's why we have come in specifically in this committee um, as a leader, as a statewide leader, as I've just articulated. I mean, I support this in part because I have put my faith in the process that this body has created, which was to create a climate council and that climate council worked collaboratively for you know a significant amount of time and continues to work to create the um, proposals that um, that you've worked on including this one thank you so much for joining us this morning it's my pleasure happy to come back if you have any other questions and i will talk with laura about your question thank you might and we might take you up on your offer of the primer on your office and at a future time don't don't tempt me because you'll be like, oh my God, why'd we ask for this? That'll be good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Richard Cowart. Welcome back. Good morning. All right, for the record, this is Richard Cowart. Um uh, Principal at the Regulatory Assistance Project, <clears throat> and I'm a member of the Vermont Climate Council, but I should make it clear that I'm testifying um, on my own behalf, really, um, based on my uh, experience uh, on the Vermont PUC in on climate and energy policy generally, and on the Climate Council. So, I'm here, I wanna be really clear, <laughs> maybe it won't surprise you. I'm here in support of S5. And I wanna answer some important questions that have been raised about S5. But I'd like to start by recalling why we're here as the Attorney General just did. I know in recent weeks, you've been spending a lot of time working on this bill and hearing a variety of opinions many different points of view. And that's terrific because it deserves careful study, of course. Um, the goals are important. Tackling the fossil fuels problem is something that we have ignored for far too long. Two giant problems, high and volatile fossil fuel costs and the climate price and the climate crisis are not going away. Uh, waiting another year, another two years, another five years is not going to make those problems go away. Every year of delay, every month of delay will cost Vermonters more in dollars and it will cost all of us more in environmental harm. How long have we waited to act? We have had climate study after climate study this legislation, this particular legislation in um, last year's version and this year's version 
have been studied and crafted, amended, and I'm happy to say improved. It's passed through three houses. It's already a year delayed. I hope you will be able to advance S5 soon. Uh, starting with my main message, okay? Um, I'm gonna follow that up with uh, four observations and then get into questions. The high level top line messages are that we have to remember that high heating bills are out of our control unless we reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Many of the clean heat alternatives are less expensive and they're more local. And we need to create a structure to make those better choices available to Vermont. Just on, I woke up uh, on Monday to hear that Saudi Arabia decided, well, oil prices were tending a little bit lower. So what were they gonna do about that? They got together with like four other countries and decided to cut back production so that we on the other end of the production chain are gonna have to pay higher prices. We can't control that, but we can control what we choose to heat our homes and buildings with. That's point one. Point two, if we leave it to the voluntary market alone, affluent people will be able to change, but low and moderate income Vermonters will, left, will be left behind in less healthy homes with higher fuel bills. We need a structure, some kind of performance standard to ensure that low and moderate income households are not left behind um, while people of means can pay to insulate their homes, install heat pumps, what have you. Third point, the clean heat transition is inevitable. You know, the writing is on the wall for fossil fuels because climate change is real. And the, someday we are going to have to make the transition. It's gonna cost, the longer we wait to get started, the more it will cost to meet our legislated climate commitments and the harder it will be to build the businesses and the workforce that we need to get the work done. And finally, last top line message for, for anyone, this is a complicated matter. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that, you know, I've had the opportunity along with, you know, other members of the uh, Buildings Task Force, the Climate Council, the Clean Heat Working Group, et cetera, other professionals, you know, to work on it for a long time. So, and here it is, you know, on your plate. Um, but as you consider passing out this bill, remember, before this act takes effect and before it is implemented, the implementing rules and an economic analysis will be presented to the legislature for review and approval. The, the check back provision, so-called check back provision is in this bill. There, there are perhaps dozens of questions that are in your minds that you would like to see more information on, but you're gonna have that, uh, that chance. Um, I've been asked by a variety of people to address some of the <clears throat> major questions that are kind of out there for you and for others, I think. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, but I'm, I'm prepared actually to sort of tee up, or tee up the, the major ones for you. Oh. So there are five and I, Happy to provide my view, my answers on those five questions. Um, question number one, I've, I've been asked by a variety of people. Why don't we just enact a fuel tax? So this is like taking you back to conversations that have occurred in this building over, I don't know, decades really. Um, and with the, a question that comes up all over the world, all over the country, when my organization talks to governments. 
big picture, there are three big policy approaches that you can take to reducing fossil fuels, the use of fossil fuels. There are carbon taxes or fuel taxes, there's cap and trade, and there are performance standards. And we in Vermont have considered all of them, um, some of them numerous times. Taxes and cap and trade <clears throat> work by pricing, raising the price of fossil fuel consumption. And global experience shows us that this has three problems. The first is that in the housing sector, in the building sector in particular, there are substantial, what economists call market barriers to prices having the effect that we would like them to have to change behavior, to induce building owners to insulate their buildings or change out their furnaces or what have you. Um, it, we, the, this legislature commissioned a study <clears throat> on resources for the future, I don't know, three years ago, four years ago now, um, that looked at this question. And they reported back to you that it would take an unacceptably high price <clears throat> in order to, for price alone to drive change. Um, and this is pretty much true everywhere, by the way. This is not unique to Vermont. Um, second problem with uh, using taxes or uh, cap and trade for the purpose of raising prices is that the price may be known. If you set a, a tax, the price may be known, but the quantity of emissions reduced isn't going to be known. Um, the Global Warming Solutions Act requires that a definite amount of emission reductions occur. And um, it's going to be very hard to know, first of all, the price, I believe, would have to be too high. Secondly, you wouldn't really know you're going to meet the target. The, the third issue is that uh, taxes will yield government revenue, which in some, some people view as a positive thing, and that could be useful. But will that revenue lower heating bills and will it lower carbon pollution? Um, it won't unless the funds are spent strategically. Will it be spent to lower emissions? What agency and government would be responsible for spending that money and ensuring that strategically valuable portfolio of resources is invested in, in order to lower heat bills and lower pollution. Tax revenue has to be appropriated year after year. What level of certainty can you have that we're gonna be able to appropriate enough money to do all the work that has to be done and ensure that it is done and ensure that that money doesn't end up paying for something else if the goal is to reduce carbon emissions. Um, just as a thought experiment, ask yourself, how have we done on renewables? Vermont's done really well on renewables. <coughs> because we have a performance standard, we're not having to pay for our renewables by government appropriations. There are some programs, of course, but they supplement the performance standard that is the main driving force. And so the performance standard on the industry is what's driving change in renewables. It's what's driving change in energy efficiency. For anyone concerned about the complexity of some of the features of this bill, and, and, and I want to say, I really appreciate that because I've been deep in the weeds on this bill. So um, I get it, but there's a lot of issues there. Um, the good news is that they're there because they're solving the concerns that have been raised throughout the whole process. And the bill as it stands now has features in it that I think are terrific. And yeah, it makes it <coughs> longer, it makes it a little more complicated, but they're terrific features. Imagine instead that you were appropriating the money to do this job. 
wouldn't you have to answer all the same questions? Wouldn't you have to answer how many heat pumps are we going to pay for? How many weatherization jobs? How are we going to score or count the GHG reductions from wood heat versus heat pumps? All of those questions don't go away just because now the government is spending the money to do the job. And they become political questions, not scientific questions. This legislation asks the PC to make these decisions based on scientific evidence about how many tons of GHD reduction you get from a certain kind of measure. If those decisions are made in the appropriations process, it's not going to be scientific. It's going to be political. This is why we have a PUC. And I speak from experience that um, this legislature a century ago created a PUC for a really good reason. And um, in this legislation, we asked the PUC to do its job with respect to this new area of work. Um, finally, I'd like to make a point about business certainty. We know we need uh, the workforce. We know we need contractors who are prepared to hire people for a career in clean heat. A performance standard with, with a lifetime provides certainty to the business community that this work is going to continue and it's not going to be subject to next year's appropriation debate. And the same is true for young people who may want to get into this work as a career, um, both on the business side and on the workforce side. Um, a performance standard with a long-term trajectory provides um, the certainty that we would need to build the businesses to do this work. <clears throat> um, thank you. Now, next question is, uh, we've heard fuel dealers happily saying that they're getting into the heat pump business. They're getting into the pellets business, as I heard. I, um, I know people who are getting pellets from uh, Borns or uh, Energy Co-op, for example. Um, I have heard somewhat conflicting stories on this topic. On the one hand, you hear uh, fuel dealers are already doing it. We don't need a law because it's already happened. And then on the other hand, you hear, oh, my God, you're going to make us do it, and it's going to cost a fortune. We can't possibly do that. So both of those things can't be true. I suspect that the reality is somewhere in the middle. Um, but clearly, if you want to look at the data, we are not on track to meet the GWSA goals today. What's happening in the market today is not close to meeting the goals that this legislature adopted in the GWSA. I will say, I pause to, I mean, I pause to say, if in fact fuel dealers and others are able to deliver what's needed, to reduce emissions and reduce bills without this law, I'm totally happy. Um, all the law provides then is a guardrail, uh, a way of measuring our progress and to ensure that we're going to stay on track. I don't think that in fact, we're on track. The, the data are at, at present are showing that and the most credible data presented to the Climate Council is that we are on pace to meet about half of our goal with respect to cold climate heat pumps by 2030. Um, we're about 90,000 heat pumps short if you extrapolate current trends. Um, we need many, many more times uh, hot water heat pumps than we are installing today. Um, we need three times more weatherization jobs than we're delivering today. And to at least uh, 15,000 advanced wood heat systems beyond what we're doing today. So the, 
um, we're not on track. The good news is that under this legislation, the, we would create a trajectory that would ensure that repeatedly, DUC would be returning and asking the question, how are we doing? How are we doing? Um, that's what we need. That's the, as, as we do with renewables and as we do with energy efficiency, we keep coming back and asking, how are we doing? What can we do now? How do we improve the program? Let's stay on track. Um, a related question that has been raised uh, is how can the obligated parties plan if they don't know what the price of credits <clears throat> will be? The fuel dealers are asking, how can I plan if I don't know what the price of credits is going to be? Um, well, first, I find this to be a surprising question, uh, but it has an easy answer, a relatively easy answer. It's a surprise coming from an industry with such volatile prices. Fuel dealers are veterans of not knowing what the price of their main product will be. That's one of the problems we're trying to solve here is that uh, fuel prices are volatile and hard to predict. Um, the price of clean heat credits will be a relatively small fraction of the total cost of, end, of a fuel bill and of the, that volatility. The, and it will be much more predictable. Um, if you look at section 8124, it creates a three-year planning cycle and a 10-year look ahead at the level of clean heat credits that would be required. So there's a projection for the purposes of planning um, built into the statute. And in section 8125, uh, which describes the default delivery agency, or agent, will set a per credit fee on a three-year period. It's right in the statute that fuel dealers and anybody else who wants to uh, know what the price of credits are going to be would, would face a, a price that is set for them on a three-year basis. And this is kind of what we do for energy efficiency. We have a three-year planning period um, for energy efficiency programs. And that would follow a potential study, a plan, and a budget. So look at section 8125. And for any obligated party who thinks they don't want to go through the, the DDA, the default delivery agent, they can do it themselves. And they can make their own business plans about how many customers they want to um, provide different kinds of fuels to or different kinds of services to. They can do it themselves. They're not obligated to go through the DDA. The DDA just gives them a solid option to fall back on. Question four, does the Affordable Heat Act provide benefits to commercial and industrial customers and small businesses? Yes. Any suggestion that the AHA is just about residential customers is just flat wrong. Um, the definitions make this clear. The inventory in Vermont is, is very well documented something like 46% of total fossil fuel use, thermal fuel use in the state is um, in the commercial and, and industrial sectors. So it's about half and half, half residential, half C and I. Um, are there opportunities to save fossil fuel in the commercial and industrial sectors? Of course there are. <clears throat> there's weatherizing the buildings, there's improving the heating systems, there's improving the water heat systems, for restaurants, they can improve water heating, uh, dishwashing, cooking. Um, so dishwashing usually isn't thermal, so I should pause on that one. Um, any other thermal appliance? And the Energy Star program, Efficiency Vermont, there are lots of places where those um, advanced electrically based uh, appliances um, are. Um, rated, made available, 
you can get rebates for buying them. Um, tier three projects in Vermont have included examples like line extensions to sugar makers um, who are burning uh, fuel oil, but could be converted to, to uh, boiling with electricity. Um, there are other, uh, probably other line extension opportunities out there. I've, I've heard of some that aren't thermal, but uh, some of them would be thermal. Uh, dairy operations like those participating in cow power and others um, can capture and use manure-based methane to displace fossil fuels and earn clean heat credits. Uh, anybody running you know, a restaurant or a small business has plenty of opportunities to take advantage of many of the, of the clean heat measures that uh, your home or my home could take advantage of. Industrial buildings and processes are, even, are more unique, um, but they, do, they would qualify for clean heat credits, uh, certainly for the building. And also there are electrical technologies that are often inherently more efficient than fossil counterparts. And in this frame, it's also worth noting that the federal tax credits that are now available for doing this work in um, commercial and industrial settings, <laughs> those federal IRA tax credits uh, can be quite beneficial to businesses, particularly if they're paying the labor force um, the prevailing wage requirements that are that give them, I think, a five times, enhances their benefit by something like five times. Um, so the tax credits are there too. And that leads to the next question. Um, why shouldn't we just rely on the federal funds instead of enacting a, our own statute? Um, now there's good news here. This is really terrific news. So we should regard this as, wow, there's uh, wind in our sails if, uh, for doing the work that we want to do. Uh, there is federal grant money um, that's coming to Vermont, about $30 million for weatherization and $30 million for electrification. That's great. And we should use the money for clean heat. <clears throat> Absolutely applied particularly to low and moderate income households. This federal money though, would only pay for a fraction of what we need. We're talking about the grant money here. Um, it would pay for approximately 3000 houses, low income houses weatherized, um, and maybe adding heat pumps to 4,000 to 5,000 moderate income and low income households uh, combined. That's a pretty small fraction of the weatherization gap of about 80,000 households that we're facing now and a heat pump gap of 90,000 heat pumps. There's also some positive news. So I'm going to say that's Great, we should take advantage of, the, of those funds, but it's not an excuse to say, oh, well, job done. Um, what about the tax credits in the IRA? Relying on the tax credits alone would be a huge missed opportunity because we'd still be burning, one thing, we'd still be burning more fossil fuel than, um, than we should want to pay for. Um, and a lot of federal tax credit money would be left on the table. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you know, those of us who've been looking at this think uh, <clears throat> that the tax credit provisions, as I say, are wind in our sails. It gives the AHA uh, a big boost, but only in coordination with a state program that actually takes advantage <clears throat> of the tax credit opportunity. What do customers really need in order to take advantage of those tax opportunities? You know, the customers need technical assistance. They need some handholding. They need a, somebody like uh, 
Efficiency Vermont, who creates the uh, Efficiency Excellence Network of contractors that people can trust to get this work done. You know, you have to create trust in the market as well. And it's going to need additional support, financial support in the form of rebates to those customers in order to really take advantage of the federal money. Um, tax credits only help if you have a tax liability. And it's worth remembering that 40% of Vermont households actually don't have a federal tax liability. So relying on the federal tax credits to serve low and moderate income households is just not, it's not a realistic strategy at all. Um, and as I said, even for the able to pay households, the existence of a trustee <laughs> network, um, a workforce, and additional state rebates, to partner with the federal rebates in order to accelerate progress, that's all needed too, even for the able to pay market. Um, so the bottom line, my bottom line on this is that instead of providing a reason to walk away, from the Affordable Heat Act. Federal funds and the tax credits provisions in the IRA offer a solid reason to enact the bill as soon as possible so we can start taking advantage of the tax credits as soon as possible and bring down that money to Vermonters. The reliable estimates that I have seen <coughs> calculate that a failure to enact a policy that would take those tax credits off the table and bring them to Vermont families. A failure to do that will leave uh, $240 million in federal tax credits that would have been available untapped. So and now I'm, <laughs> thank you for your patience as I go through those questions. Um, I'll close with this. Um, I'm optimistic about this bill because it does two essential things at once. The legislation will lower Vermont's total heat bill by billions of dollars. Uh, the most credible analysis received by the Climate Council, uh, I think I said this um, previously, found that on net, <coughs> Vermont heat bills would be $2 billion lower on account of the measures that would be installed between now and 2030. And beyond that, the savings would only continue to grow. Uh, we need to get Vermont homes and businesses off of the fossil fuel roller coaster. We're, just, we're chained to world oil prices. I mean, I, we, we, need to get, um, we need to get our heat from sources that are less expensive, less polluting, uh, and more uh, within our control. And that is what the legislature requested, required, frankly, uh, of us all in the Global Warming Solutions Act. And finally, climate change is not going away. Why are we spending a billion dollars a year to import fossil fuels that we know that responsibly we shouldn't even be burning. We need a performance standard to uh, help us all to, to uh, change that practice. Thank you for your testimony. That was um, very helpful. Uh, and I do hope you'll submit it in writing to us uh, so we can have it for reference. Yeah, sure. I'm ha happy to do so. And um, I, I sort of want to apologize for going on, but I know that you all are facing tough questions. And I wanted to try and answer. I think you, you have done a good job at that. Thank you. I have a question for you. Um, we took testimony yesterday that the the way the life cycle analysis is structured in the bill doesn't actually account for the carbon emissions from wood. I would like to know what your thoughts on that 
far. I'm thinking um, about different versions of the of the bill. Um, would would be treated <clears throat> as it is treated in the Vermont inventory uh, under this bill. Um, if, I should pause and review whatever that testimony was. I should review it. I'm sorry, because there are two different versions of in, so two different ways to interpret the legislation. One is that the life cycle analysis of woody uh, biomass would be treated the same as uh, other fuels. The second is that it would be treated as wood is treated in the Vermont inventory process, which is run by the ANR. And before I answer this question, I just want to make sure that um, I'm clear on those two different interpretations of the language. And how is it treated in the Vermont inventory? Well, the Vermont inventory starts, it looks at the forest and not the trees. Mm -hmm. The forest in Vermont is a net sequester of uh, carbon on an annual basis. We're, se we're sequestering more today in the forests of Vermont than we're removing from the forest. So it's a net negative. And because it's a net negative, the um, activities that are part of the removal process, the harvesting process, whether it's for energy or for anything else, is treated as well. It's all net negative, um, looking at the forest as a whole. So we're not going to look at individual trees and say, well, that tree just got harvested, so that's a negative, or that's a, a bad environmental outcome, because it's part of the larger process that altogether is sequestering more than we're removing. That's the, been the policy of the state of Vermont up to this point, uh, to look at the forest and not the individual trees. There are lots of arguments in this area that tend to look at trees and not forests. <clears throat> and they tend to also treat the <coughs> forest management practices elsewhere in the world, which you know, clear cutting the Amazon or whatever, um, which are in just like a thousand percent different from the way we do forest management in Vermont. And so <clears throat> the arguments get very confused because of, for, for those two reasons, that there's this distinction between looking at individual trees or individual harvest events on the one hand versus looking at, well, they're in the context of a much larger forest that over time is continuing to sequester more than we're removing. That's, in, in a nutshell, that's the, the debate on um, how the inventory is conducted in Vermont. As, but as we ramp up our use, well, first I'd like, how much of the wood we burn in Vermont is actually from Vermont? And then as we ramp up, our use of that wood, um, even if today we have forests that are sequestering in the positive column, um, but as we you know harvest them and use them at, to a greater at a greater rate, you know is that accounted for in this? If we're incentivizing conversion to to heat with wood, it would be accounted for in in the Vermont inventory on net. Um, I think the question, there are like a whole host of questions embedded in your question. Um, I want to be careful in, uh, you know, sort of being, so how to say this, being really strictly plugged into this evidence on this, okay? Um, at our current rate of wood burning in Vermont, we are, in my opinion, not in any danger of, of 
taking what is uh, a net sequestration rate and reversing it. The, we actually import a lot of wood into Vermont, which is surprised me when I, I looked at those data for construction more than for anything else. <clears throat> Um, and the, but if we want to enhance the Vermont responsible methods of forest conservation and forest management, um, we actually need to we actually need to ensure a healthy forest economy, working landscape forest. I'm personally very much in favor of land conservation and I don't mind conserving permanently a substantial fraction of our natural lands. I think there's legislation you know, that would do that. But in order to have working forests, um, we, we need a healthy forest economy and we're gonna continue to use wood. And frankly, I think it's kind of Crazy for Vermont to say, well, we're not going to cut any trees because we think they should all stay standing, but we're going to import our trees from Georgia. Uh, we're going to import our lumber from, in, um, from out of state. Um, the, so I should pause there. And, and I would also note, for the purposes of uh, woody biomass energy, uh, for heat, let's say, um, the, the quantities that we're talking about are well within the, um, the sequestration rate that Vermont is experiencing and has been experiencing. It, we are in no danger of cutting down Vermont's forests to uh, heat our buildings. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. I mean, one reason is just the physics of how much are we actually going to to, you know, how much, how big is the pellet market really going to be? Um, that's one thing. Can Another I ask thing, where's the analysis of that? Um, you said it was your opinion. And then you also said current rate, but if we're going to increase our rate, I'm just wondering who's monitoring that. And the, the, um, the Agency of Natural Resources has this information and the uh, Biomass Energy Resource Center um, has information like this. So, but here's, here's the economic point I wanted to make, that nobody manages forests for, to burn them uh, in this region. Where the wood that is burned in Vermont is a byproduct of managing forests for much more valuable saw loss. Um, the, it's basically, a, um, you know, if you ask the forester, you know, are you gonna manage this for, you know, energy crops? The answer is gonna be, well, no, there's not enough money in it. I'm managing this woodlot for saw logs. And when we're in this, when we're doing thinning in order to uh, release the better trees to make better saw logs, then we have something that we can you know, sell for firewood. Or if we had a more pellet manufacturers here, we'd sell them for pellets maybe. Um, and, but uh, it's a byproduct. It's a low value byproduct. It's not, um, something that's going to be become a big business to cut trees for heat. Okay. Now, that's, I, I'm happy to get back to you and, you know, with, I want to be clear here. I've told you that my opinion, based on what I've been told, I don't have the data in front of me, happy to provide data. That would be great. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Representative Smith. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, you 
obviously are well experienced in this field that you're discussing today. And I was looking at your bio and you've done extensive work in Belgium and, and some in Germany, am I correct? Is that fair to say? Yes. You know how much the price of gasoline is in Belgium right now? Do not know what it is. 5.91 a gallon and it's 5.57 in Germany. And that concerns me a little bit about what people may be paying down the road uh, for fuel pricing. Okay, uh, two responses. Uh, the first is this bill is not about gasoline. It will be later on down the road, I believe. Well, not in this legislation. Okay. All right. Gasoline is, and I guess I should also make it clear, I've been asked the question, what about uh, off-road diesel for tractors or construction equipment, things like that. Those are not thermal applications. And under the definitions in this legislation, they're, they're not covered. This legislation doesn't affect that. Um, yeah, I think energy, well, energy prices in Europe right now are extremely high. And they're suffering, frankly, from the fact that they were reliant on imported gas from Russia. And the Ukraine war has interrupted that supply. Um, their response to it is actually to work very hard to aggressively install heat pumps because they don't want to be reliant on volatile fossil fuel imports. I have one other question, if I may. Uh, you've indicated something. We have a concern with the labor force. Uh, do you have a plan that would up the labor force to accomplish this? by 2030 to achieve this goal? No, uh, I don't. I don't, I don't know if anyone does. I, I don't have that plan. I, I believe, I mean, it goes without saying that this is a really important issue. And there are initiatives underway to mm -hmm. enhance uh, training and to create the workforce that we're gonna need. My uh, point here is to say that this is kind of a chicken and egg kind of problem that if you don't have a policy in place that businesses believe is real, that will create a market for this work, they're not gonna hire people. And if they're not hiring people, then young people aren't gonna go into the business of becoming uh, a, you know, a heat pump expert or installer or uh, a weatherization contractor. And so um, I think a parallel effort has to be made um, with uh, community colleges, uh, technical college, um, et cetera, to expand the workforce. And I also think that fuel dealers, and this was my hope when the Climate Council was considering a clean heat standard. Our hope was that existing fossil fuel providers would say, here is a great opportunity for you to clean heat business, to sell pellet stoves, to install pellet stoves, to, ins get, um, to install insulation, to install heat pumps, to change their business from relying solely on selling a commodity fuel, get into the clean heat business. And those, it's, it's ironic to me, and this is just me speaking personally, that, that this conversation began by basically trying to create a pathway to the future for businesses that are depending on whose business model is selling a commodity that is expensive, volatile, and polluting, to give them an opportunity to change that business to a clean heat business that has a future. And I, um, I wish that more of the fossil fuel providers would embrace that opportunity. And frankly, I think 
that they will once the law is enacted. But right now, they seem to have a preference mostly to, to stick in the status quo. All right. I think with that, I'd like to take a break. For you. Why? <clears throat> questions. Okay. I think that's all questions. All right. Did you want to take questions? No? Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Rich. This has been really helpful this morning. A number of these questions we've been hearing here and from other uh, colleagues in the building. I have two questions for you. Um, one, going back to the tax credits and the effect of the federal funding and tax credits now. So it's been my sense that having that, uh, that availability, that infusion of funding and avail availability to draw down additional funding, that that has a positive effect on kind of the slope of the credit price or would be expected to for our fuel dealers, that that's going to likely help uh, credit prices be lower as we start. Yes. <laughs> can you they, just, ex can you explain that? Explain more artfully right. And so I, the real question is, that? Uh, sorry, that, it seems to me the real question is, um, what does it take to help enough Vermont customers to make the changes that are needed to reduce uh, reliance on fossil fuel, okay? Um, you know, and we've learned this through the energy efficiency programs, you know, like what does it take to get to people to replace the refrigerator, uh, you know, and to install a much more efficient one. And over time, we have experience with that question. You know, uh, when we started out, it seemed like it cost a fair amount. And then over time, we realized, I mean, probably maybe you heard this from Efficiency Vermont, but one of the modifications they made in the program early on, they would, they would offer rebates to you and me and everybody else to replace your fridge. And those things were cost effective. It was a good thing to do. Perfectly good thing to do. And it cost, I forget how many, what the rebate num number was. Uh, but later on, they discovered something that, that when Vermonters would go to buy a fridge, the, the clerk on the sales floor would, wouldn't point them to the high efficiency fridge. They would point them to the one that they, that they were promoting that week or whatever, which wasn't necessarily the best one. So Efficiency Vermont changed their model. They gave a bonus to a clerk on the shop floor who was selling the fridge if they sold a high efficency fridge. And it turns out that instead of spending 50 bucks or more the other way, that if they gave 25 bucks to the sales clerk for steering a Vermont customer to the high efficiency <clears throat> fridge, which was the one they were recommending because it would save money, they could get more sales. <clears throat> so here's what I'm getting, I'm leading up to. The question is, what's the lowest cost that we could have to pay in order to help customers make the efficient decision. And <clears throat> now let's look at a heat pump rebate. If helping Vermonters to, to pay the capital cost of installing a heat pump um, requires a certain upfront rebate, and we're doing that today um, on, at a certain rate. Um, Tomorrow, if that customer can also get a federal tax credit, a Vermont rebate can be small. So, and the, we're not, the clean heat program isn't paying for the federal tax rebate. We're only paying for whatever the margin is that is required <clears throat> to help the customer make that choice. And that, will likely include the cost of customer assistance, showing them what the choices are, helping them make a choice, helping them uh, install it, making sure the contractor does it right. You know, there's some administrative and support services that go along with that. 
And um, so that would be part of the program cost. But the, uh, the amount that we would have to put on the table to make that change goes down. So I just, I'm trying to be really clear here. And again, if we fail to do that, we're leaving that federal money on the table. And having to provide more. And we would have to provide more or we, or we just would have slower progress. And then five years from now, we'd be sitting here thinking about, oh my God, what are we gonna do now? Because we're behind the eight ball. Um, my last question is, um, can you, in this I've heard from folks outside of um, this room, um, some concerns about, uh, can you define the thermal sector and uh, you know, what fuels, people are concerned about the fuels and, and what does the thermal sector include? I think it's in the legislation. I should be. I, it, it is. It is in the bill. Folks are concerned about. So you've talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, the right. Um, other uses like making I'm, syrup I'm, or restaurants or this type of thing. I'm. It, it includes heating appliances that are used uh, to heat buildings, to heat hot water, uh, to cook food. And they're, all, they're also some commercial and industrial processes, mostly industrial processes, but uh, it does not include uh, off-road vehicle use. It doesn't include transportation fuels. Um, I'm trying to be clear about that. And I apologize, I should have a bill right here and I could read you the definition. But. It's okay. And, and of the piece, the PUC I think is coming tomorrow. But uh, you know, specifically, we've heard you know, like dye, dye diesel for off-road vehicles. That is not the thermal sector. That is transportation fuel. It's governed. I mean, it's taxed as a transportation fuel. We have a very clear uh, pathway to collect those taxes that we know very well. It's uh, a transportation fuel. Great. Thank yes. you, Representative Logan. And then, then we're going to take a break. Thank you. Um, nice, Rich. Um, I'm Representative Kate Logan from Burlington. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Um, uh, this is not about the policy in particular, more about the process of implementing um, the policy, uh, developing the regulations. Um, I know that the Climate Council had a lot of discussion about um, equity and justice related concerns with every um, recommendation that it made um, in the Climate Action Plan. I'm curious to hear um, if there are specific um, demographic groups or segments of the um, Vermont population that you feel the PUC should be very intentional about engaging when developing regulations? Um, yeah, two things about that. I, one, of the, one of the important specific improvements in S5 uh, this year was to make explicit something that was implicit uh, in the House bill last year. And that is the affirmative inclusion of low and moderate income households in, in the performance standard that a substantial fraction of clean heat measures uh, must be delivered <clears throat> to those households and that they, and, uh, and low and moderate income households are defined in the legislation. And in, in addition, a subs half, at least half of the measures that are delivered to those households have to be um, installed measures that are uh, predicted, and they're predicted because it's kind of logical, to lower heat bills over time. So they're going to get long-term lower bills because they're going to get these measures. And um, the legislation also requires that they 
pretty robust public process be undertaken by the PUC. That, that may be what you're alluding to. Um, <clears throat> that would include all parts of the state, urban, rural, and um, would include um, hearing from, you know, minority and uh, the historically marginalized and overlooked uh, members of society who have typically not participated in this kind of process. And the Vermont law on this point, I mean, I think this merges quite nicely. It meshes quite nicely with the, uh, uh, the inclusion and equity provisions that are generally applicable now uh, that didn't used to be applicable. Um, the Climate Council is strongly in support of that. It's included in the bill. It's included in the other legislation. Um, I'm, I don't know. I think it's in there. I'll put it that way. And I, I think the legislature has been really clear about it. All right, Representative Papp, but then we do need to move on. <laughs> I just want to uh, ask whether you have any thoughts on the uh, issue of um, who the obligated parties are uh, in, in this, because it, as you know, um, in terms of uh, being defined as importing in, into the state, um, uh, some uh, are wholesale companies that have depots within the borders of Vermont and, and retail dealers pick up their fuel there. And others basically, I think mostly because of lo location, cross the border and uh, to a nearby depot in the neighboring state. And so you end up with both retailers and wholesalers as the uh, a group, a mix of them. Right. As, as the... It, it, um, yes, um, and or Commerce Clause reasons, yeah. we uh, were advised by the Attorney General to write the bill that way. Yeah. Uh, and that was what the, the, what they did to the Senate. Um, my, so my opinion is that the, under the Commerce Clause, that's the way we need to write the bill. Yeah. Um, the, the good news is that this version of the legislation, and this is another change that's occurred this year, has strengthened the role of the default delivery agent quite substantially. And the, so that any, let's just take a, the, the example you're kind of alluding to is a small fuel dealer for whom the, this, uh, legislation would seem to impose a burden, uh, doesn't need to do that extra work if they don't want to. They can assign their responsibility to the default delivery <laughs> agent. And you know this is somewhat similar to what we have in Efficiency Vermont today. Um, Efficiency Vermont is there to deliver energy efficiency services from the utilities that didn't want to do it. And um, that it turned out to be most of them. But um, the default delivery agent in this legislation um, could deliver services on behalf of those smaller uh, companies, if, or actually for the bigger companies, whoever it decides to let them do that work. And the um, uh, I think that's an adequate answer, frankly, because the alternative is to create uh, an unlevel playing field. You know, for if you exempted uh, fuel dealers who went out of state to get their own fuel, compared with somebody who went to a, a bulk tank in Vermont, then you have a price differential that would be unfair and it would you'd be incenting people to go buy their fuel out of state um, or directly out of state it's all coming from out of state <laughs> so no, I, I understand that it's the commerce clause that is is defining what you know how we have to define things in, in this case I just, yeah. but that's a sort of a, um 
that, that's a consequence of, of, of having to deal within that, within that framework. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a practical legal uh, requirement. And I believe that creating the default delivery agent uh, provides an answer to those who, you know, basically don't want to get into this, the clean heat business. They just want to continue to run their trucks. All right. I think we're going to take a break until 1025. Great. We're going to reconvene our meeting and continue talking about S5. And I believe we've invited you also to join us to give us kind of an overview of the potential study idea that is in the bill, um, Mr. Cowart. And then also we'll hear from David Westman. Um, Efficiency Vermont on that well, following your testimony. Um, okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And one of the um, enhancements in this bill has has been to make explicit the the so-called check provision and make sure that the, at the time the legislature will be looking at the proposed rules that the PUC is asked to create at that time, um, you would also have available to you as, in fact, uh, they would want to have available to them uh, something called a potential study for clean heat measures. And I should emphasize, this is something that the legislature may very well be interested in, but even if the legislature weren't interested in it, the way the, uh, this process yeah, is, is set up in, in the legislation, it would be done anyway. Um, so it is customary for uh, those who are implementing energy efficiency programs, for example, complicated energy efficiency programs, uh, to do potential studies in order to better design a program of work. Um, uh, so the legislation requires that a potential study be prepared and by the Department of Public Service and presented, you know, as part of the process of developing the work plan for the default delivery agent. Um, it also requires that, that that potential study, you know, be available alongside the rules when it comes to the legislature. Now, what is a potential study? Um, it's, it's doing the best job we can do to figure out um, two things. What's the, or maybe even three things. Like what is the potential in the physical world for making the changes that the legislation, excuse me, or the performance standard calls for? Now, what is the actual, you know, if it were energy efficiency, what's, What's the potential? How many light bulbs are there in Vermont? And what could we save if we change them? And that kind of a question. Um, with respect to heating, it's how many uh, oil furnaces over 20 years old are there in Vermont? And you know, how soon could they be replaced? And how many of them are going to get replaced anyway? That's a physical question, an inventory kind of question. Um, then the, the next question that follows that is, what is the technical, it's called the technical potential for replacing those um, furnaces? Let's say, well, I'm using furnaces as the example, but you could ask the same question about weatherization um, in different kinds of buildings. Um, what is the technical potential for replacing those furnaces with cleaner heat solutions? And in that instance, you need some understanding of what the building stock is like. There are certain kinds of buildings where 
uh, it's either easier or harder to replace a, an existing furnace with uh, a cleaner solution. Um, but that gives you a, the technical potential, which is often pretty large compared with what you're really going to be able to get. The next question is, well, what's happening already in the market? How much of that technical potential is already being taken care of? And this is a topic that we touched on earlier this morning. So there's some fraction of the technical potential that is going to happen and you build that into your program design um, and work off on top of that. And then the third question is, what do we think our program can deliver in addition to what the market was going to deliver, would be expected to deliver? So you go from technical potential to asking what's happening, what, what the program design would have to deliver, and then <clears throat> The last, not the last question, because you can model, you can, you can add, always ask more questions, but the uh, program designers will then ask, how much will it cost to meet the program goals using the, you know, the appropriate strategies that both try to reduce costs and try to meet other program goals. I mean, in this case, we have program goals to deliver uh, installed measures in low and moderate income housing. So that has to be factored into the what does it cost question. And the, so there's a program design and what does it cost? And that becomes kind of iterative in the, um, in the potential study to a degree you know, you can model these things to death, but uh, generally it becomes an art kind of at the end to say, well, realistically, based on experience, I think we can get a sales rate or a penetration rate of this amount of heat pumps or this amount of hot water heaters in the housing stock in this part of Vermont. And at, at some point, the potential study, you know, says, well, I think that's a pretty good number. Or the modelers who are doing this, you know, based on experience, um, have uh, come up with an answer to the question, how many units do we think we can get? Um, and what do we think it would cost to do that? Now, the, I mean, maybe that's, I should stop there and just take questions if there are more questions. Do members have questions? Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, well, a little bit of a clarification. So uh, we're not a clear, no, it's a question. So um, it's my sense that, um, you know, uh, you know, um, Mr. Cowart, I'm a big fan of bringing this down to my next door neighbor, sixth grader level, greatest extent possible. So um, <clears throat> it's my sense that, this study, um, this potential study can help us really scale um, and understand the scale of what's possible. And I think that's important uh, when we think about the testimony that we have heard from um, the Secretary of Natural Resources about uh, what is statutorily required. Uh, she's provided some testimony about uh, what it will take to meet our, green, our GS. WSA goals for 2030 that has um, that number, the potential impact of that number has been pretty widely circulated throughout Vermont tax rates. Um, this potential study, I think, allows us to look at, okay, uh, uh, do we actually have the staff, the workforce, do we actually have the homes, do we actually have um, the materials to meet those goals? And if not, what, what can we do? And then as you testified earlier, and we come back and check again next year uh, with the PUC, what is the progress that we're making? Is this changing or over time that we continually come back to that and check with that North Star being what's in statute, the goals, and then this being something that helps us temper 
uh, that with what's possible or understand better what's possible. Am I understanding that correctly? I believe you are. Okay. I, and the, it's important, well, I'm gonna say two, two things that I think will sound inconsistent and I apologize, but you use the term North Star and that's a good way of thinking about it. The, the legislature has adopted ambitious mandates for under the GWSA. The, um, this legislation as written is written to make it possible to achieve a mandate. Yes. Veterans uh, in the energy policy world will know that it might, we might be pleasantly surprised on the one hand, as we have been with renewables, that the costs came down rapidly and performance became a lot easier, certainly than I expected when I was a regulator. Um, and great, I mean, we sometimes, we get good news. Um, on the other hand, maybe the potential study would reveal that it's going to be difficult, particularly in the early going, to, to work at the pace that we had hoped, at which point in the legislature um, would get to decide whether we should make a change to the trajectory and start out slower. Uh, I, I think that's an appropriate legislative role. And um, on the other hand, I wouldn't want to make that decision now because you don't have the information. Well, and as part of this, we know that uh, in the other body, uh, the governor's staff asked for a half a million dollars and additional staff at the department to ensure that this is a quality product because we're charging the Department of Public Service with doing this. Does that seem like an appropriate number um, and staffing level for this type of analysis that we're looking to have done? Does it seem like I, I, much? It seems like a pretty big number to me, but I'm... Okay. I come from the nonprofit um, advising world, not the for-profit consulting world. So I think you, there might, you might ask other people uh, about that price. But Thank you. I, I guess I would say that, um, you know, there are other aspects of this work that, um, that right now we're not investing enough in. And for example, I think as a state, we need to um, launch a more of a workforce development program with uh, training at community colleges, VTC, et cetera, in order to, uh, for the entire, <coughs> entire climate transition, not just for the clean heat portion of it. Um, that's an aside, I, I, I guess, in, in, you know, in answering that question, but that the Department of Public Service uh, could look at that question as part of the potential study, and therefore that might be a reason that they're thinking of a bigger budget. Okay. Thank you. And I know we have um, also uh, Dave Westman, who also has some specific language, I think, Madam Chair. And, and, uh, and I would say on the, the real details of the potential study, Efficiency Vermont is one of the best sources anywhere in, in the world on, on this topic. Uh, so hearing from them makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you want more detail, I'm happy to help, but right now I defer to them. Great, that's a great uh, segue for us too. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And we'll invite uh, David Westman, who's joining us <clears throat> soon. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me here this morning. Thank you for letting me uh, testify remotely in the interest of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, for what I hope will be a um, short and uh, friendly amendment to my testimony provided last week. So for the record, my name is Dave Westman. I'm the Director of uh, Regulatory and State Agency Affairs for Efficiency Vermont. 
And uh, the testimony that I provided last week uh, is still uh, what Efficiency Vermont is suggesting. And I submitted additional, um, uh, uh, as I said, friendly amendments to S5 section 8125, the default delivery agent um, for the committee's consideration, uh, specifically on this topic of a potential study and um, identifying within this, um, within this budget category of S5, exactly how that potential study uh, uh, should be looked at, uh, specifically uh, using some um, specific terms that we would expect to see as results of that potential study being technically available, maximum achievable and program achievable uh, thermal resources, and including a comparison to the legal obligations of the uh, thermal sector portion of the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, and considering market characteristics uh, for the delivery of clean heat measures within the state, um, and specifically whether that workforce characteristics are capable of meeting uh, both consumer demand and towards meeting the obligations of the Global Warming Solutions Act. So I think that this is very consistent with the conversation that we are having with the committee and um, this supplemental testimony, I think, is um, ripe for your consideration, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for this. Um, Representative Scalia. Yeah, so this is on our website. I don't know if you maybe would walk us through it. One thing that I've noticed, Dave, is it doesn't explicitly give us a date. Um, so if you can just talk to us about um, whether or not that's intentional, um, or, and so why, uh, and if not, what an appropriate date that aligns with the rest of the bill would be for having a potential study done. Yes. As I read this section of the legislation, this is a recurring clause where every three years, the Public Utility Commission, the department and the default delivery agent, as well as other stakeholders would be reviewing the proposed three-year plan. So I did not think to put a specific date for the first potential study because the assumption would be is that effectively July 1st, which this date um, is specified as being the initiation of the proceeding and every three years, at least every three years as um, Tom Nauer testified to last week, this potential study could be part of that consideration. And so I did not think to put a specific date by which the potential study should be done, but your point is, is well taken. And in fact, in our efficiency world, uh, we do have obligations for when that potential study is done in the context of our demand resource plan. I don't know that we need statutory clarification on that, but generally speaking, we like to have that potential study at least a few months in advance, if not um, more, uh, before our demand resource plan is filed with the commission as a proposal. Generally, that happens within a couple months of each other, but we've been working on it for many months. And so my thought would be is that if the default delivery agent is named in February, that the potential study uh, should be done shortly thereafter, because almost <coughs> immediately the default delivery agent would need to develop their plan. And that plan should be very much informed by these results of the potential study. So if you're looking for a time frame, it would be around the time of the first check back next year. I have another question for Alan on this. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so um, we have legislative counsel in the room uh, who had actually uh, flagged this uh, issue as something that the committee might want to consider. So I would just, if we could, could Madam Chair, invite legislative counsel to talk about the time frame and the um, kind of vagueness that this leaves, what we have in here. Actually, so can I just say, I would like to ask Mr. Westman a couple questions before we go there, if you know. Um, so um, just to help me understand, does Efficiency Vermont, sounds like you have utilized a potential studies in your work, but do you perform them? And are they something, it sounds like, well, just answer that part first. No, we do not. The Department of Public Service hires a third party contractor to complete that potential study. And we have members of our team who are subject matter experts 
planning specialists who review that work and are part of the development, but fundamentally it's a third party entity completing that task. It, would, it is not efficiency Vermont. And, and are they often done annually? I thought, I mean, I guess in this instance, are you saying it would be done every three years as part of the three year cycle, but yeah. That would be my understanding, yes. We do not, we do, not do a potential study every year. That would be very costly. That's what I the, thought. The potential study is completed every three years prior to the filing of a demand resource plan proposal by the EEUs. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, members have further questions for Mr. Westman before we invite Legislative Council up. All right, Ellen, would you join us for a few minutes? Sure, I do have to go, but I'm will be spending most of the afternoon with you so I can come back. Can I ask a question yeah. uh, of Mr. Westman first? Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. Do you have any sense, Mr. Westman, of how long it takes to conduct a potential study? I do, roughly about a year to um, nine months to a year. They can be relatively technical. They can involve a lot of back and forth and various iterations. So for example, our team started working with the department. I'm going off of memory here, but roughly around April to May of last year, we saw a first draft in approximately early November. And then the final draft was filed with the commission in January of this year. Um, okay, that was my only question, but I didn't know if anyone else had questions because I will be here all afternoon. Just my question around, uh, you know, do, do we need a date? So um, Mr. Westman is indicating that you know, because this is part of the normal procedure, we may not need a date. Um, you know, there's a little bit of uh, contention, it seems, between the um, legislature, legislative branch and the executive branch around this policy. So it seems like we might want to be providing as much clarity as possible to the executive branch. That's, uh, you know, a, a concern or a question I have. So I'm happy to have you come back to this later this afternoon. But the, the date is a thing. I just want to be clear. We need it. Or we do not. It's restrictive or it's supportive. Um, so I had raised this issue because I do think, and this is a this is definitely a policy decision, um, but because the whole legislature will be evaluating the clean heat standard program in totality in January of 2025, this does seem like it's something that would be helpful in those considerations. Um, so you may want to you may want to consider if you of having a, a date so that it is available at least sometime during that session so that it can be part of the conversation on whether the clean heat standard rules should move forward. Uh, Mr. Westman. Thank you. Um, to support what Ellen is saying, uh, I think that in order for the default delivery agent to begin its work on program development and even larger picture program costs that the commission would then have to report to the legislature, uh, I fully on board with having a potential study uh, be identified well in advance of January 2025. And before that second check back, my understanding is that there's a time frame for a February 2024 report that would give the legislature an indication of not not only the scope of work and the findings of the of this proceeding, but um, you know, in order for that DDA work to actually begin in earnest, um, I would I would strongly urge that the that the uh, committee consider uh, a date in 2024 as, as part of that. Is it possible that we would want an initial, a deadline for the initial or a time, a, a, a date for the initial um, potential study and then language that indicates that it's a part of the normal 
There are drafts developed in a potential study, yes. And a, uh, a good potential study will seek stakeholder feedback um, on technical matters. And generally, I, 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 I think that any potential study should, should hear feedback and have a clear response to that feedback. And so a, a draft potential study would be a reasonable expectation uh, as to the timing of when exactly that could be developed and the because it would be contracted through the department, I would refer you to probably their time frame uh, for when the Department of Public Service thinks that something could get implemented. All right, further questions? Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Numbers, uh, Ellen, thank you. I know you have somewhere else to go. So yeah, yeah, I can come back potentially around 1140 if that would be helpful. Um, I think we should go for um, right now. I think we're essentially for 10 minutes after the floor. I'm not sure our agenda says that. Oh, okay. Um, well, okay. I think because there will be some floor mm -hmm. activity. And so I would say. Stay. Yeah, so let's count on 10 minutes after the floor members to reconvene. Um, we have Ellen and another one other witness for that. And then so we'll see you then. I think that will be fine. Okay, thanks. thanks. And do members have discussion or questions that they want to bring up now? On the overall bill. Yeah, I, I would like to discuss something. It's, it hasn't been brought up, if I may. Uh, Vermont is a recreational state. This bill perhaps will affect recreation in Vermont. And I know the, the backlash to, the, to it is going to be people that want to recreate in Vermont will, will pay whatever they have to pay. And that, that's the answer that I've heard from uh, people in favor of S5. Uh, we have a lot of boaters, we have a lot of ATVers, a lot of snowmobilers that come up from down country. Has anybody had any discussion about what the repercussion could possibly be as far as recreation in Vermont? I don't think it's been talked about. So I guess I, are you, are you saying uh, this bill is not addressing transportation fuels? So I don't know. Is that your concern? Well, gasoline is going to go up. We all know that. Not because of this bill. I mean, it could go up for other reasons. This is well, it could. But uh, well, if you want to go further, there are people that have homes up here <clears throat> that will be coming up. I've got it right in the corner of my road. Uh, people from Connecticut bought a home. Yeah, we just heard uh, once again. Nineteen percent of our housing stock is folks who. So I, it, it just hasn't been talked about. And I know uh, fuel prices have fluctuated since I can remember. Uh, I can remember my father talking about fuel prices in 1973. They've gone up and they turn the spigot on a little bit more up north. They come back down again. So it's fluctuating a lot. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I just got concerns about you know, about the whole bill, yeah. about what people are going to be paying. Um, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what we've just been talking about, the uh, the date for the study. Now, <clears throat> is that study, that, that's um, the people involved, like the stakeholders, is that correct? That would be doing the study? Is that what I just heard? Part, yeah, but, but, but what I think you just heard was that when they do a potential study, it does include outreach. Yes. Okay. So that would be that part in the bill that the ANR conducts that study? Public service. Oh, GPS. Okay. Okay. Excuse, thank you very much. 
Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, um, I've been familiarizing, re-familiarizing myself with what is now Act 154, um, the environmental justice legislation. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not set to implement um, until 2026. Uh, <clears throat> Environmental, uh, let me get back to the page. The Environmental Justice Advisory Council and the Interagency Environmental Justice Committee were to be convened or have already been convened, apparently. Yeah. Um, but the recommendations for how to implement the act um, don't need to be adopted until 2026. So I'm hearing that, like, for example, the potential study, et cetera, um, you know, this, you know, the outreach process is gonna have to be conducted in a way that's in compliance with Act 154, but it, there is no obligation. Okay. Um, so I've been trying, and I've, a lot of folks have reached out to me with concerns about um, a community engagement process. And so it does seem like we need to say something more um, about how the potential study and the PUC regulatory development process needs to be conducted, considering that it will all take place before 2026. And Maybe something as simple as just referencing Act 154. Yeah. And, you know, um, not in compliance, obviously, but just following the recommendations. Or I don't know. I don't know what to say because we don't have the, I mean, we don't have, and then there's another bill that's not being taken up until next year. Well, it hasn't even been drafted yet about, um, you know, compensation for participation in processes like this. So we're kind of, yeah, we're, we don't have anything we can point to as the standard yet that's already. And we can ask Ledge Council where, where she would recommend and how, but yeah, I, I get your point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to um, also come back for a moment to kind of the North Star conversation that we were having before, which, which you know, is this policy is connected to. That's the goals that we put into statute. And the goals that we put into statutes are from the Paris Accords, which the governor has committed the state to both in 2017 and again in 2021. And, you know, what this... Um, what this policy is doing is connecting a mechanism that allows us to continually review how we're doing and uh, getting there. It supports the transition between our, um, supports our smallest fossil fuel dealers, I believe, in helping them transition, as well as uh, we know that folks with means, we've heard testimony about this, are already transitioning. This makes sure that we're bringing those folks along. And so, uh, you know, with our commitment, our repeated commitment to the goals in the Paris Accord, um, here is another effect of that. There are a lot of other countries and states that have also made those commitments. And so, you know, there's a lot of other government action that is taking place both in our country and in other countries that is working to meet those emissions reductions. I believe very strongly. Um, well, I believe a couple of things very strongly. First of all, I think actually we all really care about not harming rural and poor Vermonters uh, with these policies and protecting them as much as possible and ensuring their warmth. Um, I believe that not implementing something like this that helps us kind of connect and continue to reevaluate really exposes us to more risk from the actions of other countries and other states. They, we are tiny. They will move markets. They are moving markets. They are changing um, the trajectory of 
labor, of training, of materials, supply chain. And so uh, I'll come back off the soapbox, but I wanted to just remind us that those goals that are in the Global Warming Solutions Act, where they came from, that they're not just our goals. There are hundreds of parties that have committed to those goals that are acting. That action is changing a lot of things that are going to affect Vermonters. And we've committed to those. This is a mechanism that allows us to engage really thoughtfully and actively with progress towards those goals instead of um, kind of haphazardly. And what do we have left? Um, you know, without consideration for, are we bringing along the lowest income folks? How are our fuel dealers doing? Are we starting to clear cut trees? <laughs> you know, I mean, this kind of helps us kind of connect all of that. So. I'm done, Madam Chair. It's promise. Right. I'm done. <laughs> Representative Tory. Yeah, just to add to that, I, I noticed like we hear from the Department of Public Service a lot. Um, you know, safe, affordable, reliable is what we want from our energy sector. But we also really do want equitable, and we know to have a just transition that it won't happen unless we front and center. Potentially. So to me, this is an opportunity to bring that to life in a way that it hasn't been able to yet. Um, the other thing I heard yesterday, I uh, can't remember who it was because um, about prioritizing weatherization. I wondered if the committee had thoughts about that because when I think about just the different types of housing people live in, the quality, uh, and the cost of, you know, we do have pretty stable electricity prices, but you still don't want to be paying more than you have to, right? And so weatherization is really important. And I just wonder, um, you know, if that's something that would happen on the DDA level, could prioritize, you know, to make sure that weatherization steps don't get missed. Um, have yeah. yeah, and I think it was testimony that we got that had some specific suggestions around that. And we're going to look at timeline with um, Legislative Council this afternoon, but also you're going to walk through tomorrow's timeline. So today's walk through today. Anyway, what we have on the, the our web page is the latest draft with some of those changes that have been brought to us. So would hope and just going to suggest that perhaps since we have a little time right now, <coughs> we want to read through the latest draft so that we can be ready to talk about um, incorporating those changes that are in here, but also others that you may have on your mind. So when we do that this afternoon. Would it be possible for us to get hard copies? Sure. I mean, you, you can definitely send those to the printer yourself. Oh. We can talk about that offline. It's pretty Thank easy you. to do. Okay. So you ought to do that. Happy yeah. With that. yeah. Um, any other discussion type questions before we break for the morning? Representative Sackley. Yeah, not so much a question as just um, commenting on what we heard a little bit earlier about the connection between the Inflation Reduction Act and the and the affordable standard that we're talking about. It. I'd really like to know more specifically about what we expect the, that relationship to be like. And we heard about federal money potentially being left on the table um and that this would help us not do that and i'd like to know really more specifically about how how that would work and also about the uh, those the, the tax credits in that federal bill um, i think what we heard today was that um that if we didn't do this that people who don't pay federal taxes would not be able to benefit from that bill but i want to make sure that that's really true I'd like to have um, corroboration of that, that that's really the case. I know sometimes federal taxes, um, you can still get reimbursed even if you don't pay federal taxes under certain types of credits. Yeah, I think JFM can help us pull out someone in. Yeah, Representative Evans. Um, yeah, I think JFO, but also, and of course, he's welcome to say no, but I'm Yes, saying that Efficiency Vermont has been digging into what the IRA offers and whether or not Dave Westman would 
care to answer any of that off the cuff if he has any information. And if he doesn't, obviously. We should just arrange testimony. Yeah. We can, uh, we can arrange yeah. testimony. Yeah. Okay, sure. All right. Further thoughts? All right. All right. Thank you all. We will adjourn for the morning.